Welcome to today's webinar where we will be looking at several new features within SalesPad. Uh, my name is Matt Grierville. I'm a sales engineer here at SalesPad. Um, as always, we'll have the question box out there. So if you have any uh, questions that come up throughout the webinar, uh, feel free to use that and we'll make sure we respond uh, at the conclusion of the, uh, the demo. Um, unlike the, some of the previous webinars we've done where we have one module that we're looking at and we kind of have a cohesive workflow from start to finish uh, within that module, we're actually going to be looking at several different areas of the software today, uh, several areas that may be lesser known. Um, so I'll kind of go through the agenda for today to start out and then we'll uh, dive right into the demonstration. Um, so some of the new features we're going to be looking at will be the dispatch module. Uh, we'll talk uh, quite a bit about that. Uh, we'll also look at in-transit transfers and the functionality that you can now uh, perform within the SalesPad desktop environment. Uh, we're going to look at item restrictions, uh, vendor returns, the system user card that we've added to SalesPad, uh, security feature functionality that we've added to uh, uh, make finding security protocols very simple and then uh, learning more about those protocols through our knowledge base uh, documentation that we have online. And then we're also going to look at the equipment card and uh, finally, last but not least, the manufacturing configurator, which will allow you to essentially uh, configure products on the fly, uh, build a bill of materials, associate that with the routing, and then uh, create a manufacturing order to build that product. So again, uh, please use the question box as we go through each one of these functions. We'll kind of be jumping around a lot here into these different areas of the software. So, so please use that question box and we'll make sure we um, we get back to you on with, with answers at the conclusion. Okay, so here we are in the desktop, uh, SalesPad desktop environment, and we're just going to follow that same agenda that we just went through. So we'll start with the uh, dispatch module. Um, to show this, I'm going to start with an order and, and, and show how that's scheduled against either a vehicle or a driver. Um, and then we'll go over to the route and see that, how that route's actually generated and what that looks like. And then we'll kind of wrap up by looking at the mobile portion and how that extends out to the mobile side. Uh, so I've got an order pulled up here that I previously created and I'm going to go into that order now and uh, point out a couple things that you'll notice. So I've got my order here, I've got the line items that were previously added and um, with the dispatch module we're going to add these two plugins at the top that you can go ahead and set up here to either schedule against the driver or schedule against a vehicle depending on your preferences. Um, for this demo I'm just actually going to schedule against the vehicle. So when I click on this plugin it's going to launch my vehicle dispatch board and you'll see that it will automatically load up all of the different available trucks that I have um, available to schedule this order with. Um, you'll also notice that the date that loads in is uh, the same as the required ship date on that order. So I have today's date on that uh, particular order that I opened up. So that's going to automatically launch my Tuesday, December 6th uh, scheduling window for each of these trucks. Um, now, as far as the view here goes, you've got a couple of options to change things up uh, based on your, your uh, uh, preferences. So with the vehicles, you can actually uh, limit the number of vehicles you're looking at. So if you wanted to turn some of these off and just look at truck one through six, uh, you can go ahead and uncheck those and those will be removed from the view. Um, I'll go ahead and bring those back in. Another thing that we do through setup is we allow you to categorize different types of vehicles. Um, and we do the same thing for drivers. You can categorize different types of drivers. Um, in this case, if I hit my drop down, I've got a tanker, I've got a flatbed, and then I've got cargo type vehicles. So um, it's just another way to organize your, your fleet or the number of drivers, the types of drivers that you have available to schedule orders with. Um, on the driver side, maybe you have uh, delivery specific drivers and, and, and sales technician uh, drivers that would actually be, for, be uh, performing service out in the field. So uh, you can distinguish those two. Um, this, this layout can actually be changed as well. So I'm looking at a day view, but if I wanted to right click and change this view uh, to maybe the work week, or maybe I wanted to look at a monthly view uh, to schedule out even further, I've got a lot of options there for uh, the way this information is displayed. I'm just going to jump back to the daily view here and uh, now I'll go ahead and schedule this order with one of these vehicles. Um, so to, to schedule it, you're actually just going to double click on the time uh, within that truck schedule uh, that you want that particular order to be delivered. So if I go into truck four, for example, and let's say I want to say uh, this is 
going to be delivered at 3 o'clock uh, on December 6th by truck number 4. I can just click on the 3 o'clock appointment. That will launch my appointment creation tool where I can then uh, pick a start time and an end time. So this will allow me to uh, bake in any anticipated time that's going to be required at that location to make this delivery. And then I can also do things like set the status as you know pending, in progress, or complete. I can go ahead and mark that as pending since it's not done yet. Um, and then I also have a note section here. So if I want to specify any specific notes that need to be communicated to the driver, um, maybe there's a key that's required to gain access that's at this particular location. Uh, we can go ahead and notate things like that there. So once I have that um, assigned to a specific truck, uh, that will show up as a calendar event. And then if I wanted to later go back and change this and move this around, uh, we make that very simple uh, within this dispatch module. So let's say, for example, truck four can no longer do it, so I need to schedule this with truck two, and I actually need to change the delivery time to 2 p.m. I can simply just drag this appointment and move that over to 2 p.m. on truck two's uh, schedule. So very, very simple, very, very flexible to, to kind of uh, schedule the orders and then move them around and make adjustments on the fly. Uh, so once I've done that and I'm happy with the, the truck that I've picked uh, to execute that delivery, I can just go, go ahead and hit OK and exit out of that schedule view. Okay, so now on the back end, as we schedule those orders, a route is automatically built. And the route's going to consist of all of the stop information as well as a link to the sales order that's going to be delivered or, or the service that's going to be performed at that particular location. So from my top um, menu, I can go into the dispatch module and actually go into my route search. And if I bring up all of my different routes, you can see all of the different routes that I have uh, previously created. So I'm going to go into one that I, I set up a few days ago and uh, show you this just because it has uh, several stops on it and uh, kind of show you what that looks like. So this is truck number six, Route 2. Um, the start time for this was on the 29th of November. There's four different stops that are going to be made on this route. And as I scroll through each one of these stops, you can see the stop properties will update over here on the right. Um, so as I go through that, the address is updated. The estimated arrival time is updated. The estimated departure time is updated, uh, so on and so forth. Now, if I go over to this other tab here, the sales doc link tab, as I scroll through these, we'll also see uh, the specific order that's going to be delivered at each one of those stops. So that you can see there's order 10419 at this stop. There's order number 10418 that's going to be delivered at this stop, uh, so on and so forth. So that's kind of the stop information. We also have some basic property information at the top. Uh, so we can assign it a name, as we've already done so. Uh, we can assign this a vehicle, which we've already done through the order scheduling process. But if we also wanted to associate a driver with this, uh, we can pick a specific driver that would actually do this route as well. Um, you'll notice that we also do the shipping weight. So as we have all these sales orders built out, if you do have item weight information stored on the item maintenance card in SalesPad or GP, uh, we will recognize the aggregate weight of all of those orders that are going to be delivered on each one of those stops and then produce a total shipping weight for that route. And this can be helpful if you have certain load restrictions. Um, you can kind of back that total shipping weight for the route up against the truck's capacity. So um, there's some, some good visibility there as well. Now, another tool that we have uh, from the route page is actually the printed version of the route report, which will list out all the different stops that need to be made, as well as the material that needs to be delivered at each one of those stops. Um, and if it's, a service, uh, if it's a service order, then you can list out the service hours or uh, maybe the replacement parts that are going to be used to perform that service. It doesn't necessarily have to be uh, a delivery type route. So if I go into print, uh, we'll see the dispatch route report will show up. I can go ahead and check that and I'll open up a preview just to kind of show you what that looks like. And uh, here we can see um, our route report for the 29th uh, scheduled for truck number six. And if we scroll through this, we can see stop number one, two, three, and four. We can see the arrival time, uh, the estimated arrival time and departure time at each location, uh, the customer's name, the address, and then the sales order that's associated with that stop with the specific line items and quantities that need to be uh, delivered or used at that location. So you can see as we scroll through this, here are all the stop listings. So that can be helpful. 
<clears throat> so here I have the mobile application pulled up and we're looking at the same route that we were looking at in desktop. So you can see up at the top, I've got truck number six, route two displaying here. And uh, what we're looking at is the, the, the different stops um, that we had on that particular route. So stop one, two, three, and four. You can see the customer referenced there in the upper right hand corner. Um, now as I'm going through and, and completing each one of these stops, I can check in and check out. As I do so, a couple things are going to happen. We're going to timestamp the arrival as well as the departure time. And you can see that these first two stops have been uh, completed, so the departure time is noted there. Uh, you'll also notice that the color indicator on the left side here has been updated as well. Um, so if you recall, I had three different color indicators on desktop. That same functionality extends into mobile, so light blue is pending, red is in progress, and the black are the completed, uh, the completed route stops. So uh, these first two are completed. You can see I've got the departure time stamped. And now this one I've checked in at, and you can see the arrival time is 1.23 p.m., and the color indicator is red, indicating that this is actually in progress. And when I go to check out, that will update to, uh, to black. So you can see I've checked out and now that color is updated from, from red to black. So in addition to the check in, check out and the timestamps that we're going to provide, you can also go into the specific sales order that needs to be either delivered or executed at that location. So this document icon will allow you to do just that. So if I uh, tap on that document icon for this particular stop, um, this will actually take me to the specific sales order that I need to deliver at that location. And I can see right there at the bottom, those are my line items that need to be delivered and the quantities. And once I've completed that delivery, if I need to do certain things like maybe capture a customer signature, I can go ahead and go into my menu and use the standard mobile functionality that you may all be familiar with and go into my signature capture option uh, to sign that document, uh, indicating that the delivery has been made and then navigate back to my uh, dispatch route stops. So that's a quick look at the mobile portion of dispatch. And now we'll kind of go through and just look at some of the back end features that make this all possible. So up at the top um, navigation menu and sales pad, you can see I have a dispatch uh, module. And if I go into that, there's a couple different components that go into this, uh, this functionality. So uh, the first thing is driver and vehicle setup. So if I go into my driver search, I can look at my existing drivers or I can create a new driver here with this option. Um, I'll just open up an existing driver card and uh, show you what that looks like. So uh, we're looking at the uh, driver card now for Drew Smith and you can see that we can build out certain information like uh, you know, what's the driver's license number associated with that uh, particular driver, uh, what's the hire date. Um, this also has user-defined user fields that you can set up. So if you have uh, maybe an expiration date of their commercial permits that you want to track so you can follow up with them to make sure they're keeping all of their, uh, you know, uh, DOT requirements up to date, you can track some of that information in here as well. Now at the bottom with these, these different tabs, we're also going to uh, give you visibility of a lot of additional information such as what's this particular driver's schedule. So you can see the, uh, the actual driver's schedule at the bottom. Uh, we can add notes for that driver. We can track additional user fields. So again, um, you know, maybe a, a, a DOT certification expiration date that you want to keep your eye on. You can add date fields there. Um, and then we also have an audit log that you can track. Now, same thing applies on the vehicle side. So we can set up new vehicles. And this is a listing of those nine trucks that you were seeing from my scheduling tool. Um, we can go in uh, to this trucks card and we can see, you know, uh, information like maybe what's the VIN number for that vehicle, what's the mile per gallon, what's the current mileage on it. And then we can also see the uh, schedule for that particular truck. So at the bottom here, we can see all of the different uh, appointments that are built out for that truck. Um, we also have user fields again, so maybe you want to track an image of that vehicle. Um, you can do that. We have notes and uh, an audit for the vehicle as well. 
Um, now, another thing to note that uh, so far I've showed you kind of delivery and service scheduling for vehicles, um, but you also have the ability to uh, schedule a different type of appointment, and that might be like maintenance, for example. So maybe you want to block off a certain number of hours on a particular day because uh, this vehicle needs an oil change and you don't want to accidentally schedule that to perform a delivery if it's going, going to be uh, getting an oil change at that time. So you can see we have different appointment types as well. Uh, so if I wanted to block off this particular time for uh, maintenance, maybe we need an oil change, I can do that as well. And you'll notice the color is different, so you can associate different colors with different appointment types there. So in addition to the driver and the vehicle setup, we also have a dispatch configuration uh, feature that will allow you to define those different delivery or appointment types, the different statuses that those appointments can go through, as well as the different vehicles and drivers. And that's, this is where you're going to set that up. So if you recall, when I scheduled maintenance for that vehicle from the vehicle card, I had a maintenance appointment type, and here's the color that corresponds to that on my uh, scheduling board. So this is where you can define that information. Um, you can also set up your appointment status. So I had a very basic workflow of uh, pending, in progress, and complete. You can define multiple steps for that, and you can also define the way the colors are updated as you check in, check out, and uh, complete those different stops. Uh, here's where I have the vehicle type set up, so uh, tanker, the flatbed, and the cargo, and then my different drivers. So I have uh, service tech-specific drivers as well as uh, delivery drivers that I can uh, identify here. So now that we've completed uh, the dispatch portion, we'll move on to the next item on our agenda, which is the uh, in-transit transfer functionality. Um, and this could be really good if you move a lot of inventory from one location to another, and you may need a, a kind of an interim site to, uh, to, to keep track of that inventory as it moves from one location to another. Um, th this, could be, this could be very helpful for that. So to access the in-transit transfer functionality from within SalesPad, we're going to go to our top ribbon here and uh, the inventory module, and we'll go to uh, the in-transit transfer search. So what we're looking at here is a, a grid of all of the uh, previously created trans in-transit transfers, and you can see I've got the uh, document ID number, the from site, the via site, and the to site. Um, the, the from site is obviously where you're pulling that material from initially. Uh, the via site's that interim site that I mentioned if you need to keep track of it as that trans uh, transfer occurs. And then the two site is the ultimate destination for that material. So you can kind of see uh, these are all the different transfers I've done as well as the, the from, via, and two site. Now if I want to create a new in-transit transfer, I would just go to the new option here and that will launch my, my new uh, in-transit tra uh, transfer document that ca I can go ahead and uh, build out. So if I want to add an item, um, just like adding any item in SalesPad through a sales document or a purchase order, we've got the uh, inventory lookup function that we can use to um, find the item. If we know the item we're looking for, we can go ahead and key that in and tab off of the uh, line item. And that will pull that item in with a description. And then I can go ahead and decide what my from site, my via site, and to site are going to be. Uh, so in this example, I'll just use my, my main warehouse there. Uh, we'll move that um, from, from warehouse to the south warehouse as my interim site, and then we'll finally have that end up in my north site here. Okay, so now that I have my from site, via site, and to site defined, I can pick which quantity, what quantity I want to actually move uh, from my, my main warehouse there. So I'll go ahead and just plug in a quantity of 10 here and uh, tab off of that, and I'll save that. Now from here, I can actually do my fulfillment. Uh, which is going to allocate to this in-transit transfer. And uh, th this is helpful, especially if you're in a multi-bin environment and you want to pull those from a specific bin, or if you're doing lot-tracked or serial-tracked items, you can pick specific lots or serials that you want to actually move uh, from one site to another. So for my actions uh, menu here, I can go into uh, in-transit transfer fulfillment. So here we have our fulfillment window opened up, and you can see I've got my line item with the transfer quantity listed, and then I've got my available to pick from bins with the available quantities there. So I'll go ahead and select this first one, um, E10S4. I've got 436 available to transfer. I'll hit my arrow over, and now it's going to ask me to uh, which bin I want to move that to. Um, so this will show me all the different bins I have available to move it to. I'll select the one I want to move it to, and that will go ahead and uh, move that into uh, that bin when it's uh, completed. So I can hit OK on that, save that. 
So now you can see that once I've done that fulfillment, my quantity fulfilled is updated from 0 to 10, and the status is now updated to picked. Um, so now that I've completed that, this is kind of where GP will take over. Uh, you'll perform the, the, uh, the actual shipping transaction and then the uh, final uh, receipt transaction entry um, against this in-transit transfer to move that inventory from the VIA site uh, to your final destination to site. In addition to that functionality, we also have some printed form options. Uh, so from the in-transit transfer view, we can actually go into print and we can do the in-transit transfer report and that will pull up uh, just a line item view, printed form, showing the item number, the quantity that we're moving, uh, the quantity that's been picked for this, uh, what site it's coming from, uh, the VIA site, so the site that's going to be the temporary placeholder for this material as it moves, and then the final uh, site, destination site that that's going to move into uh, once the shipped transaction is performed in GP and the final receipt transaction entry is executed. So up next is item restrictions, and to access item restrictions, we're going to go into the inventory uh, module and we'll access item restrictions from that module. Um, now, as I mentioned, when we were kind of going through the agenda, this is really uh, a helpful tool if you have certain items that can't be sold to a, a select group of customers or maybe a geographic re uh, region that it can't be sold to. Um, this is going to allow you to define um, those restriction groups and then the, the uh, specific details of the items and the customers that that would apply to. So here we have the item restriction tab opened up and I'll just kind of cover briefly the workflow here and then I'll get into some specifics about the example I'm going to show today uh, in, in today's demo. Um, so first on the left hand side we see the restriction group so this is where you're just going to basically give uh, the restriction group a name and in this case you can see I've labeled mine EPA California. Now in the center section, this is where you're going to define your group details. So what items or item classes or item descriptions um, are going to be used to flag that restriction within SalesPad. And then finally over on the right, uh, this is where we're going to define the group customers that this is going to apply to. Um, so this could be a state, this could be a, a group of customers, a class, um, a specific customer, uh, whatever the case may be, you have a lot of options here to define that. Um, now getting into my specific example, so I'm going to use this item as my restricted item today. This is a uh, item number 2700, an aftermarket exhaust system. Um, and in my restriction, I've basically defined that this cannot be sold to the state of California uh, for whatever reason. Maybe it doesn't meet the uh, emission standards or uh, whatever the case may be, but I've restricted this uh, for any customer that's in the state of California. Uh, so to do that on my item restriction setup here, I've got my group name, then I've chosen the field name item number. So I'm keying in off the item number since I know that. It's item number 2700. Uh, but you can, you can see you don't necessarily have to do that. You can key off of anything related to that item really. Um, then I've defined uh, what I want that to, to um, the relationship I want to have with that particular value. So in this case, I've selected equals. So anytime item number equals 2700, we're going to apply this restriction against this uh, group of customers. And the group of customers I've defined is anything that has the state equaling California. So this is just an example, but again, just like on the field name for the item number, um, you can select anything really off of the customer record. So maybe a specific address, maybe a phone number, uh, maybe a city, state, um, you know, a comment that you've added. Uh, there's a lot of different things that you can restrict off of and then uh, those values can then be entered and uh, the relationship can be defined with several different options as you can see here. So now with that, with that item restriction defined, um, we're gonna, again, we're going to restrict item 2700, which is an exhaust system for many customers in the state of California. If I go in and try to create an order for a customer from California, I'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. So if I go into state and I filter down by customers in the state of California, I open uh, James A. Smith here, create a new order for James and we'll go ahead and try to key in that item number 2700 tab off of it. You can see it won't let me. It says item 2700 is restricted. Uh, so I just I can't add that and that's because it's recognizing the relationship between that item number and this address and saying that that cannot be sold to that address. Now if you were to go into your inventory lookup and type in 2700, this item actually won't even appear. So it won't even be an option that you can add from your inventory lookup. 
So that's kind of a high level view of the item restriction. Again, I used a very basic example of an item number equaling a certain value and then having that associated with a restriction for a state. Uh, but you can get really creative and complex with, with these item restrictions. It's a very robust tool that we now have uh, with the, di with the uh, desktop product. Okay, so up next on the agenda, we're gonna look at vendor returns. So this is going to be a return that uh, you've got material in from your vendor, you found it to be non-conformant in some capacity, uh, or maybe it's something that you didn't order, you wanna send that back and uh, either have it replaced or get a credit. Um, SalesPad now has vendor return capabilities. So uh, to access that, you're gonna go into your uh, purchasing module from the main menu here, and then you're gonna go into receipt transaction line selector. Um, now, the receipt transaction line selector is really a way to give you multiple um, angles of getting into a specific receipt to find a specific item to return. Uh, so the basic workflow of this screen is, is this. We've got uh, the ability to look up specific receipts by item number, uh, by vendor, or by purchase order. And as you update each one of these, uh, the receipts uh, that are available to select from will update as well. So for example, if I know I'm looking for a receipt that's tied to item number 10001, I could enter that in and make that my search criteria. And now all of these receipts over here um, have that item contained somewhere in it. So that's kind of the item lookup. Um, same thing for vendors. So as I go through the vendor look, um, I can actually look at all the uh, POs that have been generated from that particular vendor. You can see my purchase order list is updating as I scroll through. Um, and as I get to a specific vendor, then I can go into the PO and then the PO will update the corresponding receipt so I can also access it that way. So, so really this screen is all about just ease of use and giving you multiple ways to arrive at the same information. Um, if I go back and, and just use my item lookup, we'll actually show how this uh, return to vendor document is generated. So I'll go to that 10001 um, and then I'll go to a specific receipt. So we'll go uh, receipt number 1178 for example. So I received uh, 50 in originally um, on this and if I want to transfer this, let's say they were non-conformant, uh, they weren't to my specifications, I want to send them back to the vendor. I would simply just say uh, transfer line and that's going to bring that over as a return line and then I can go into create vendor return. Um, now this will automatically launch a return document. It will bring the line item in with the description and the quantity that I want to send back. Um, from here, if your vendor has uh, provided you with an RMA number uh, to identify the return shipment, you can go ahead and add that here and I'll just uh, put in a generic number there. And then once I save this, um, we also have the feature to automatically replace the goods with that vendor. So if I have that checked, uh, when I go to save this, we'll actually launch a new purchase order to replace the 50 uh, that I'm returning. So when I save this, you can see I've got a receipt number 1415 uh, to return those goods, and it automatically launched a purchase order now with that default vendor um, that uh, was associated with that return. And then I can go ahead and save this and uh, distribute this PO to my vendor however I do so. Now just going back to the, uh, the return document, um, if you do have specific lots or serials that you need to return, we do actually have a fulfillment uh, feature on here that you can uh, pull up and actually associate a specific lot. Uh, this item in particular is not lot tracked, but if it was, you'd have the uh, uh, lot information available or the serial number information available. So we do support that as well. Um, now the final processing of that return uh, is still done in the GP environment, kind of following the same um, uh, you know, typical sales pad format where we're going to allow you to do all the operation stuff, but the final uh, posting level activity will occur in the GP environment. So now that we've looked at uh, vendor returns, we'll transition now to the system user card. And uh, the system user card is really a way to collect and aggregate information against uh, one of your particular users. So what sales orders have they been involved in? Uh, what CRM activity or CRM contacts have they brought in? Um, there's user-defined fields, so maybe you want to track additional uh, skills or uh, things that are associated with that particular user. And I'll show you what that looks like next. So from the main uh, sales pad navigation menu here, I can hit this drop down and you'll see we have a sales pad uh, administrator users card. So and this is actually associated with um, SalesPad Administrator, which is the user I'm, I'm functioning under. But if it was uh, a different user, it would just display their name. So 
Um, I'll just kind of run through this functionality real briefly. So th the first thing we see is obviously the name that's assigned to them. Uh, you can manage passwords from here. Um, you can also manage the security groups that they're uh, that they belong to. Um, also with our counter sales module, you have the ability to set up stores and drawers and right here on the system uh, card, you can actually associate a store or a drawer with that particular user. Um, we do have images that you can associate as well. Um, in this case, I've just used the SalesPad desktop logo, but if you want uh, maybe an employee ID photo or anything like that, you can have that uh, incorporated right here on the system, uh, system card. So um, that's kind of the property information at the top. Now at the bottom with these different uh, tabs, I'll kind of run through these. So again, as I mentioned, you know, CRM contacts as they're bringing in setting up contacts, which ones are associated with this uh, particular user. So you can actually see all of the CRM contacts that they have. Um, same thing with sales documents. So what invoices, what orders, what quotes, uh, what returns have they, uh, has this particular user been involved in? Um, and, and just like all of the different document or item history queries that we have in SalesPad, it's all driven by, um, you know, selecting the months to show. So in this case, I'm looking at six months. And then, of course, the documents um, that, uh, uh, that you want shown as well. Um, same thing with purchase orders. So the purchase order activity you can see uh, right there. Uh, we do also have these group by uh, filters. So if you wanted to group certain POs by maybe their shipping ma method or um, their uh, you know, subtotals or PO types or something like that. You can actually group these quite easily from this drop down menu here. Um, we have notes. So if you have any specific notes associated with this uh, particular user, so works remote on Tuesdays, I just had a note there. Um, and then also uh, user defined fields. And in this case, I've just set up a tab called special skills. So I've noted that um, this particular user has uh, an understanding of Dynamics GP and then uh, several Microsoft products as well as SalesPad. So that's really the system, uh, the system user card. It just allows you to kind of collect information um, against uh, specific SalesPad users, set security, or, or set, set uh, security groups, um, stores and drawers, uh, track the different um, uh, activity that they've been doing within the uh, SalesPad environment. So moving on next to security, we've actually included a lot of different right-click functionality within SalesPad that will allow you to drill back to uh, more information on the security that you may uh, want to turn on or turn off or adjust. Um, and then from that security, we also give you uh, right-click uh, uh, options to actually jump back out to the documentation on our website. Uh, we've spent an enormous amount of time building out our knowledge base and a lot of really good uh, documentation for you. So um, I'll kind of show you how you can quickly jump back out to that environment to learn more information about a specific uh, piece of functionality within SalesPad. Um, so the first thing I want to point out is the right click to jump back to the security settings. So on, on any of these tabs, we can right click on the tab. And of course, you know, we can untab if we want to pull this out of sales pad and set this on a different monitor. Um, but we can also go into security. So security is an option. And if you select that option, it will actually take you back to the security editor and filter out the security grid uh, by that particular uh, window that you were accessing. So here you can see I was in the customer search grid. I selected security as an option. And now I'm looking at my customer search security protocol. And uh, you can see all of the different additional layers of uh, security setting below that particular item. And this works throughout SalesPad. So if I were to go into uh, purchasing, for example, and I go into my back ordered items report, I can right click on that, go back to security, and there's my back, uh, back ordered items report. So it will take you specifically back to that particular security protocol if you want to know more information or, or adjust the settings accordingly. So once you've found your uh, security that you're looking for, we've also incorporated some right-click features to actually, as I mentioned, take you out to our knowledge base uh, on the website with additional documentation. So um, here you can see I went back to my backordered items report. I can right-click on that, and you can see here's my plugin for documentation. Um, if you click on that hyperlink, that will launch the, uh, the website with the uh, documentation that's related to that specific security. So. So last but not least, we're going to go into our manufacturing configurator. Um, and this is part of our extended pack, um, manufacturing extended pack. So uh, this will allow you to essentially configure a product on the fly. 
uh, based on the different attribute choices that the customers selected. Um, and then that will actually build a bill of materials on the back end as well as a, a string code part number that represents that bill of materials in, um, as a finished good. So let me just clear a couple of these windows off and we'll go right into the uh, configuration module. So um, the configurator is accessed through the top ribbon here uh, when you get the extended pack. Um, there's a couple DLL files to add, and once those are added in, you'll see this uh, configurator tool here. Um, and this will give you the ability to set these up as well as view and, and modify any existing uh, configurations. Um, so to, uh, to kind of go into this, we'll just access one of these uh, item numbers that I had pre previously set up. Um, so I'm going into the configuration setup for item number 3700, and this is a, uh, a clutch assembly. So this is an automotive type product. Um, where you have different options that the customer can choose from. So um, just running through the top properties here, just uh, briefly, we have the item number itself. We have the configuration type. So this is specifying what this configuration is going to result in when it's done. And in this case, this is going to be a manufacturing bill of materials. Um, in order to use this and have this result in the manufacturing bill of materials, it is worth noting that you also have to have the uh, manufacturing pack uh, turned on in GP as well. Um, so you can see there's my description. I've also got some pricing options that we can build out as well, whether we want pricing to increase based on certain options um, or if we want to default back to standard pricing. Uh, we have a few options there for, uh, for price types. Now, um, getting down to kind of the, the, the bottom row of tabs here, this is really where you're going to do the bulk of your setup. So um, under the details, uh, this is where you're going to define your different attribute groups. So in this case, I've got an attribute group for base content, friction plates, clutch springs, pressure plate. I've got a uh, max torque question that I'll kind of show you what I mean by that when I, when I actually add this to a sales line. And then an optional pinning gear here that I have uh, set up as well. Um, so once you have your attribute groups uh, named, you need to pick a control type. And the control types are selected through this drop-down menu. And you can see that we have uh, a few different options. So we've got a checkbox. So if it's just one option and it's a yes or no, if it's checked, this is part of it. If it's not checked, it's not. Um, so you can do a checkbox. You can also do a configuration which is essentially defining a configuration within a configuration. So if you have a smaller uh, subcomponent of that larger parent that you want to uh, configure as a separate item, you can actually have that set up that way. Uh, we also have drop-down multiple selection options where if you uh, want to have a drop-down menu with multiple options to choose from, um, or, or, or multiple items can all be chosen, um, you can set it up that way. We also have a drop-down single selection and then a text box option uh, where if you want to have some kind of like quantity that's entered that translates to you know how many of a particular item are going into that bomb or maybe in my case with this max, max torque question that I'll show um, it's actually a qualifying value where um, we're, we're asking the customer a question and based on the value that they give us it will either allow us to sell it or not and I'll kind of uh, explain that a little bit more when we show that on the sales order. So once you have your attribute groups and your control types defined, um, then you can go over to your options and define the options that are available for each one of those control types. So in the lower right-hand corner, if I hit this option arrow, this will take me to the next uh, page of the details tab. And this is where I can define all of that information. So for my pinion gear, there's only one choice. But if I scroll up, you can see uh, for pressure plate, for example, I have these two choices. Uh, clutch springs, I have these three choices. And uh, let me just go through um, the, these choices and kind of uh, show how these all function. So um, you're going to name, give each option a name. So that's the first thing, and then provide a description. And then you're going to de decide what string code you want to be added to the actual part number. So essentially, as these options are chosen, we're going to take the root number that was associated with that parent item and begin to augment that number with all these string codes based on the options that are chosen. So this is the string code that you're going to assign uh, to each of those choices. And then from here we can set a price adjustment. So if we want the price to change or build out in a certain way based on that option that's chosen, we can, um, we can have a price associated with that. Um, and then we can also associate a specific item number. So this is actually an item lookup. Uh, through this ellipsis, this is actually going to launch our sales inventory lookup where we can select a, a particular item. Now these items don't have to be a one-to-one -one relationship. If you wanted to have like a subcomponent kit or a phantom bomb or something like that associated with this option choice, uh, you can do that as well. It doesn't have to be just a singular item. 
Um, then we have the quantity that's going to be added to the bill of materials when that's chosen, the unit of measure, and then we can also associate pictures. So on the front end, if we want to make this very user friendly, uh, we can incorporate a lot of uh, uh, images with this. So that's, that's kind of the details. Um, so there's two sides of it. There's the attribute where you're building out your attribute groups. And then there's the options side of that tab, which is defining the option, the actual options, the names of those options, the string code that's associated with it, and the item number that that's going to pull and add to your bill of materials uh, when that's chosen. Um, we also have a feature called dynamic configured items. And this will allow you to basically um, set up item add-ons that are uh, driven by multiple attribute choices. So let's say, for example, you need to determine height, width, and color um, before you can pick the correct item from inventory to add to the bomb. You can actually set up dynamic configured items that would channel all three of those attribute choices into a singular item add-on. Um, there's a lot of other flexibility we can do with uh, quantity formulas here. So if you wanted to um, you know, be able to enter a quantity and have that adjust the quantity of a particular item that's in the bill of material, there's a lot of flexibility we can do with this uh, particular feature. Um, we also have restrictions. So restrictions will allow you to define interdependent relationships with the items that are chosen and future items that may be chosen. So um, in the uh, demonstration I'm going to show you from the sales order, this pinion gear is actually limited by the type of friction plate that's chosen. So you can see as I highlight the pinion gear, um, friction plates is now bold. Uh, and if I drill into that, you can see that I've got four options. I've got K2, standard, light and heavy, duty. Um, if the K2 is chosen, this pinion gear option is no longer available. So you can build out these uh, sort of restriction relationships, uh, which are great because if you have a, a very complicated product that you're selling and you don't want to rely on the expertise of your CSRs to make those judgment calls on what actually works with, with, with what other items, you can actually build that logic into the order entry process and prevent that from happening. Uh, pricing, um, so this will allow you to set up specific um, option combinations and a static price that needs to be added to the sales document. So this is kind of a dynamic pricing uh, uh, configurator that will basically look at the option choices and then drive to whatever price you've specified. And then we also have a, um, a dynamic routing build out. So you can actually take some of your predefined routings for this particular item and then set up conditions that those routings would apply. So in my case, I have a couple um, routings that I've set up and I've got a very, bi uh, very basic set of conditions that would apply. So in this case, if the clutch springs are medium, this routing is going to be applied with the final manufacturing order. Uh, for this one, if uh, light clutch springs are chosen, this, this routing will be thrown. Um, the example I like to use for this particular um, feature is, uh, let's say you're manufacturing two, two types of tables. You've got a 48 inch table and you've got an 84 inch table. Um, and depending on what size the customer chooses, you have two different band saws at two separate work centers that can accommodate both sizes. So if they chose the 48 inch table, you may want to send that to the band saw that can accommodate the 48 inch side. If they want the 84, maybe you want that to automatically link it to the work center that's, um, that, that's within the routing that has the, uh, the band saw for the 84 inch size. So, that's where that can really come into play, where you can route those appropriately. So now that I've kind of gone through the back end, uh, let's just take a look real briefly at what this looks like on the front end for the CSRs when they're entering an order. Uh, so I'm going to pull up my uh, test customer here, Aaron Fitz Electrical. Uh, we'll go ahead and generate a new order, and I'll bring that root number into the item as a sales line, and uh, we'll go ahead and build out a product here. So. 3700, if you recall, that was the root item number. And when I tab off of that, uh, SalesPad recognizes that as a configurable product, so it launches our sales line configurator. And then from here, we have our different attribute groups with the options uh, that are displayed right here. We've got our item details, so this is going to bring the image information from the different options as they're selected. Over here on the right, we have our configured items. So this is going to display what's effectively our bill of material. We have uh, listed here our original item number as well as the string code item number that will rep represent uh, this new um, finished good information, the, the new bill of materials over here. Then we have our quantity, our unit of measure, our pricing information, as well as our routing information. So as we go through this, uh, since we did have some routing set up to dynamically uh, integrate into here, we should see our routing. Uh, pull up as we complete the configuration. 
So just running through this, uh, the first choice is uh, friction plate. So you can see I've got these different options. We'll go ahead and uh, choose the light for now. Uh, go on to clutch springs. We've got light, medium, heavy duty. Go ahead and select the medium. And you can see as I'm doing this, it's checking them off. It's adding items to the bill of materials. It's throwing those images up into the item detail and it's augmenting that root number with the appropriate uh, string codes based on the options I've chosen. I'll continue on. I've got a pressure plate anodized or non-anodized. I'll make that selection. And then here, this is the max torque question. So in this case, uh, since this is a motorcycle clutch that uh, we're configuring for a customer, um, an important question we need to ask is how much torque is being delivered from the customer's engine uh, to the rear tire currently in uh, foot pounds. Uh, because if it's over a certain torque rating, this clutch may not hold up to that kind of power. So for example, if the customer responds and says, well, I've got about 300 foot-pounds, it's a kind of a race bike. Um, if I put in 300 as the value and I tab off, I get a red X here because it's an invalid input. Based on what I've configured so far, my torque range is 90 to 250 foot-pounds. And if I go beyond that, it may not hold up to the application. So I don't want to sell that to that customer. Now, if I go back and I put in a value that was within that range, 240, for example, now it gives me a green uh, checkbox and I can go ahead and move on to the next item, um, which is my, my pinion gear here. So um, again, getting back to the restrictions and how those can be helpful in order entry, if you have a very complicated product, you can build those restriction questions into the process so um, you don't have to rely, like I said, on the expertise of your, your sales staff. Um, now this last one, this pinion gear, you can see this is an optional. It's got this eye icon here. And this is an optional add-on that I can throw into the bomb. Now, if you recall, this was limited by the uh, friction plate. So if I were to go back up and instead of light, I chose the K2 material, you can see that that pinion gear is no longer an option for me because it's not compatible with that K2. So that's an example of the interdependencies um, that you can set up uh, as you're building out these uh, configured products. So um, now that I have everything checked off, um, I'm not going to go with my optional add-on pinion gear. You can see my configuration is complete. I've got a final string code built that represents this final configuration. Um, you can see that I also have the routing name identified uh, based on, uh, I believe that was tied to the clutch spring that I choose. So from there, I can go ahead and add and close this to my sales document. And this will replace the, um, the original 3700 item with the new string code item number. Um, I have this set up to automatically back order um, my configured goods because I'm assuming I don't have them in stock. So once I save this, I can then complete the process if I want to uh, by actually issuing a manufacturing order to produce that good. And we actually have a uh, Create MO plugin right here on our options that you can actually uh, set up right here on the sales document. And when you select that option, uh, that will generate the MO, and if I go over to my Manufacturing Order tab on my sales document, you can see uh, there's the MO number uh, to create that item I just configured. So with the configuration tool, in a matter of seconds, you can really go through, itemize the option choices with the customer, uh, build not only a bill of material, dynamically link the routing, create a new item number, um, and then also generate the MO to actually produce that finished good, um, all, all right there from the sales document. So with that, uh, that concludes the new features demo. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Again, um, we'll be getting to that question box immediately after this, so we'll be able to respond to um, any of the questions that may have come up throughout the webinar. Thank you for your time.